All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for joining. We have folks from San Francisco, from Australia, from Buenos Aires. Appreciate all you guys. My Spanish is not where it needs to be, so hopefully you guys are good with English. A few uh, housekeeping notes. This will be recorded. So if you do uh, raise your hand, and I'll talk about this in a second, and show your face, it will be recorded. So I want to let you know that ahead of time. And throughout this process, it will be interactive. It will be conversational. So you can raise your hand via Zoom at the bottom of your screen, and you may be unmuted to ask your question. And if you don't want your face on here, you can also ask questions in the chat box and the Q&A box down there at the bottom on Zoom. So some questions may be chosen while we're in conversation and others may come at the end. Appreciate that. And also a quick blurb about me. I have an eight-year-old and a two-year-old here and they may join us from time to time. So heads up there. All right, so I'm gonna talk to our panelists a little bit. Uh, James Hancock from MWAH, moi, and Wayne Tarkin, who is an Agile HR coach and also an Agile faculty at University of Pennsylvania. So James and Wayne, sorry, James here. Talk a little bit about yourself, what you do, some fun things like that. Yeah, sure. Great to be here. And uh, I'm always excited to see cats, kids, and everything else that hops on Zoom. And that's, <laughs> all very comfortable and that's not a bad thing. Uh, I am the Australian. You'll hear that from the bad accent pretty quickly. I apologize in advance. Uh, I'm working on my American accent in parts. Um, based here in Philadelphia, looking at our operations starting moi, uh, which was said beautifully, Michael. <laughs> we're, we're all about rethinking core HR practices and processes. Uh, we do that in our kind of core way of working, which looks at mindset, culture, and well being, and then five core HR processes recruitment, performance, talent development, reward and recognition, and change and transition. We do that in a whole bunch of ways that'll probably come out through the discussion, but Happy to talk to folks about it later on. I think we're all working in a really similar and interesting space at a really interesting time. Wayne, how about you talk about yourself a little bit? Cool. Well, I'm trying to get rid of my New Jersey accent. So <laughs> it's been a challenge. I have big move. Uh, I went across a body of water, but from the Philadelphia to the New Jersey to Delaware River, not the <laughs> Pacific Ocean, but um, I still have my accent. I still have bad jokes, but... Um, Pleasure to be here. Big fan of Hacking HR and, and uh, what Enrique Rubio has done and uh, looking forward to the conversation. I'm an Agile HR coach. People typically say, well, what's that? Um, it's not your CIOs, IT, Agile. It's, it's a variation that we've adopted. Uh, most recently, we, we ran a course at the University of Pennsylvania in a graduate organizational dynamics program where we kind of blended Agile techniques and leadership practices to really make some impacts in emerging leaders. And, and so the goal here for me today, for us, is to take some of the mystery out of Agile. It's not, again, people think it's this pervasive IT, very structured, um, but it does have some elements, but it's really more of a way of working, a way of thinking that needs a leadership element to be successful. So glad to be here, Michael and James. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, James. And for the audience, we're gonna jump into a brief 101 on design thinking and Agile HR, uh, which James and Wayne will take into. However, real quick, uh, talk to us about what you're doing for your mental health during COVID-19. Everybody's well aware from uh, CNN, Fox, everything that's thrown in their face every day long, uh, every day long, all day long, on the physical aspects of COVID-19, what's not really discussed is the mental health side of things. So for myself, i um, actually been doing a lot more walking than I have in the past. Dropped a few pounds, actually, which is good news. And been chopping a lot of wood. I have a fire pit out back and a fireplace downstairs getting ready for the winter. And chopping wood does a lot for my mental health, getting the anxiety out and um, a lot of angers at some points. So, Wayne, talk to us about what you're doing for your mental health during COVID-19. Well, I'm slowly going crazy, so I'm not sure I'm doing much, if anything. <laughs> um... You know, it's been tough. Uh, I guess for the key for me is sticking to a routine. You know, you're tempted because you have less face-to-face -face meetings and things can start a little later. You're tempted to kind of stay in bed late and things like that. So I've really been focusing on a routine. Uh, I've been doing a lot of stretching, you know, uh, to help me with the exercise. So that gives me some relief. I have my cats, so they're always uh, 
coming at inconvenient time, but you know, I make time for them and the purring of a cat is really soothing. Um, and you know, occasional cocktail, not any more, not more so than before, but, uh, just managing, uh, and for me, I, I, I'm enthused about the environment. I think there's lots of opportunities. So I'm actually mentally pretty, pretty jazzed up. Um, although I could probably do better relaxing a little bit. Thank you. Wayne, how about yourself, James? Yeah, look, I think uh, they're mainly, no, they're all good ideas. Uh, I think one thing I would say before giving my little two things is, um, and, it may, and it's coming out a lot and it should be in this hacking HR community, is just, you know, we're not often thanked for the hard work that we do in HR, if I can put it like that, having been on both sides of the fence in roles that aren't HR and, and some that are right in there. And I think, you know, we might not be list on the essential list uh, through all of this, but the work that people are doing, what we're hearing from our customers, our clients, organizations is quite unbelievable. It changes obviously on a dime or a nickel uh, all the time, keeping head above water. So I think everyone here is doing an amazing job and, and please keep it up. I don't think we're through it yet, but uh, it's gonna be, you know, have a long tail, but I think amazing efforts. Mine are two kind of simple things, both always wearing a mask, but one is hitting a tennis ball against a wall. <laughs> it sounds really weird. I found one. It's a very, very good competitor and I never win against it. And the other one is, I've, a bit like you, Michael, I've started trying to do a little bit of jogging after not jogging since college. Uh, <laughs> and I'm right near the art museum here in Philly. So I always do it to the tune of Rocky. It's very embarrassing, but I'm the only one who knows my playlist, except for everyone on the now. So yeah. Just simple stuff, but routine, I think, is really important. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And briefly, before we go on to the 101 on design thinking and Agile HR, which I'll let these two gentlemen speak about, quick reminder, uh, everyone who recently joined, who joined earlier, you can raise your hand via Zoom at the bottom of your screen. And you can also put it questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box. And we will get to them while we're conversation, conversating, excuse me. And we may also get to them at the end. So please join in. This is a conversation more than us talking at you. We want you to talk with us. So with that in note, I'll jump over to James. Uh, talk us a little bit about design thinking, a brief one-on-one. And please ask any questions you have about uh, design thinking with to James or Wayne about Agile HR as we go through it. So I'll leave it to you, James. Yeah, sure thing. So I've kind of, in thinking about this, I put a kind of couple of headings on it. So I think, let me tell you a couple of examples of where I've applied it. I'll give you a bit of my view on it. I'll give you a bit of what are the key phases that normally come into it. And this will be fairly similar, give or take some of the language, but fairly similar, whoever, whoever's theory or whoever's kind of practice you're looking at. And then I reckon a couple of good resources on that, that are not mine. I'm not claiming any credit for them, but I think they're just great and openly available that people can grab that I found helpful. Um, it'll, I'll just take a couple of minutes. So where I've applied it. So I've had a couple of careers of sorts. One is in HR. The second one is on the trading floor of a bank. And then I've come back into HR because I love it. Um, and I learned a lot about people from being on a trading floor of a bank. I'll just throw that out there. Uh, where I've applied it are a couple of ways. In the HR realm, it was to build an, inter an internal talent portal at a bank, uh, which was pretty cool. Using design thinking, we worked out what we needed to do, what we were trying to design, and then we used Agile to implement it. And I think that's kind of a good point. And I think Wayne agree or, or throw anything in, uh, you know, at, at any point. But I think, you know, design thinking and Agile kind of fit hand in glove together, where designing is about putting humans at the center of what you're doing, worrying about their needs, their feelings, their wants, their desires, kind of everything you can think of, not having assumptions, fleshing out what they're really looking at, and using that to design solutions uh, as well. Agile is a great way of implementing them and applying them with a little bit of flex, but great frameworks, which, which Wayne will talk about. The other one that was a little bit more funky, and we built that in 12 weeks, by the way. So from go to woe with a team in Vietnam, a little bit face to face, and then a lot over Zoom, you know, before it was popular in some ways, it's a few years ago. Uh, the other one is applying quite a well-known theory that's sort of in the design thinking toolkit called jobs to be done theory and a guy called uh, an American guy called Clay, Clay Christensen uh, who actually passed away over the last sort of year or a few months, I think more correctly, um, but had a theory called jobs to be done. And he said, basically, we need to worry about 
what you're really trying to achieve when you're employing a product or service. And that's quite a, it's sort of an interesting one to put your head around, but it's, he uses milkshake quite a lot. And the milkshake you have on your drive to work or the smoothie you have on your way to work, what job is it doing? It's filling your hunger at breakfast time, etc. But you could employ something else to be able to feel that job to be done, which is hunger, breakfast, etc. a range of ways. So he sort of, we applied that interestingly with CFOs and treasurers in banking to say, what jobs are they really trying to do? We have all of these products and services and it's, you know, quite the maze for them to navigate, but really what they're trying to do are fairly simple things like, worry about cash flow, manage their risks, things like that. Um, so my view on design thinking is probably not the most purest one, but I think what you really need to do or, or things to consider are, it's absolutely worth applying that uh, in your toolkit of many different things you can look at in your work as kind of the modern HR person. Um, you shouldn't always go to the ideas or the solution part, which seems like the fun part straight away. It's about understanding what you're really trying to solve for. Um, so for me, design thinking is about appreciating the people um, that are going to use whatever it is you're building, designing, changing, rethinking. It doesn't always have to be brand new. It can be a bit incremental. And it could be in HR, a system, a process, a policy, some sort of practice. It could be pretty much anything. Um, but it's about putting the user or the person at the center of what you're doing, deeply empathizing with them. You could use it interchangeably with human-centered design. When I look at that, I would look to a couple of sources and it will be similar where you look. Stanford Design School is kind of one of the originals, uh, in my opinion, and IDEO, I-D-E-O, which now has a bit of a university is another great example. Um, you get five phases. You get something like empathy, which is about understanding your user's needs. Second one is define what are their, what, what are their problems, basically. Ideate, which is kind of, again, seen as the fun part, but basically challenging your assumptions, creating ideas. This is where you could look on any video or Google or you know, anything you want, and you'll see a thousand different ways you can, uh, frameworks and ideas you can ideate on. Wayne and I were sort of discussing that, you know, most people would probably think, yeah, I've got one on my wall, a post-it note. However, uh, when they think of design thinking or brainstorming, brainstorming is not a new concept. It's been around for a long time. So I think you know, this is sort of a framework that's been building over time. Uh, you don't have to throw away what you have done before, but it's about bringing those things to your toolkit. Um, so the idea phase, challenging assumptions, stuff like that. Prototyping, and there's a whole range of things. Again, this is, you can go really deep into prototyping. I look at prototyping like before you spend all of your money, make sure your idea is good at the simplest level. My wife, as an engineer, absolutely does that well because before they build a great big building with millions of bricks, they do a really small test to make sure that it's structurally sound, that the product looks good, that it you know tests out in the conditions properly, things like that. But you do something small testing that it works for the user group before you, um, you know, sink out money. And then you do a whole range of testing. So they're kind of the phases. Empathy, define, definition, ideate, prototype and test. And you'll get pretty close to that on how you, depending on who, who, who you're looking at, what theory, but that's a good framework to use. Thank you, James. Cool. Yeah, we often get stuck on what's most convenient for our apartment, our company, and what we do in our daily lives. And we tend to forget the end user and what their experience is going to be like. You'd be shocked how much that happens. Thank you very much for the 101, James. So that's let's awesome. jump over to Wayne, and he can talk a little bit about Agile HR, which he has a ton of experience with. Go ahead, Wayne. Well, thank you. So I started out uh, in HR, been in HR for 20 plus years and had a slight diversion in 2008, uh, 2011. I actually went to work for IBM as a scrum master, which is a project leader in an agile scrum environment. And I started building software, which was new to me, um, dealing with teams in India and China and Germany and things like that, you know, in an in agile environment. And I, and I realized that Agile did one thing I hadn't really seen before. It actually worked. It actually helped big project become successful. Now, if you're like me and the people on the call, you know, you've worked a lot of technology projects, spent a lot of money, spent a lot of time. Generally, they were unsuccessful for a variety of reasons. And it was frustrating. And, you know, being someone who's always been interested in solving problems and figuring out stuff and fiddling with things, I said, you know, maybe this Agile has a place in HR. And 
I realized, though, that the, that the technical side of Agile the used in software development is, is much too complicated for the normal everyday practitioner. But what are the key elements we could take from that that could transfer, right? Um, well, I learned it the hard way. I originally, when Alan was talking about all the pure agile things that made sense and you got to do uh, velocity and burn down and you got to do uh, sort of planning and retrospectives and people's eyes would kind of blaze over and they'd be falling asleep on me. And I realized that uh, that wasn't going to work. And, and so uh, I struggled for a while to figure out how do you sell this? How do you get people to understand it? And I came up with something called EBITDA. And so for these on LinkedIn, uh, feel free to take a look, connect with me. You'll see, it's my seven principles, experimentation, break big things into small pieces, incremental iterative of work, time boxed activities, uh, self-guided teams, developing servant leadership, and always be engaging the customer. Those are the seven key practices. Now, you don't need to be a, a IT person. Uh, those things are pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. A lot of them are intuitive, some are strategic, some are tactical. Uh, we'll talk about that later. I think, to me, Agile really is just a way of working and thinking that uh, needs an element of leadership. And so during the course we delivered at Penn, we actually combined it to realize that Agile by itself, because it's uh, a little overwhelming and can be complicated, it needs an element of leadership. So things like creating a safe space, asking the right framing questions, all part of uh, our lexicon now of, of that. So again, it's it's... It's just a simple, simpler way of doing things, breaking big things into small pieces. You have shorter meetings, you have less documentation, and we'll get into it later on. But if, if you take anything away from this, it's really breaking down big things in smaller pieces and incrementally, incrementally building it until they scale. And that's really, that's really the way it works. And that's the view of Agile. Thank you, Wayne. You mentioned one thing in there about less documentation and HR. I think everybody can raise their hand for that side of things. <laughs> I, I, I can actually I'll tell you a story. Uh, I was uh, talking with a uh, uh, CHRO and, and she was telling me, you know, uh, I forget the exact words, but something defective. The next person that gives me a one or two page document instead of a 36 page PowerPoint deck, I'm going to promote. <laughs> because uh, imagine you know you go into a leader and you spent hours on this great deck that you that you love and you think is has everything in it and then you go to this meeting with his leader who's been to five other meetings and five other people have come to him or her with these great ideas and 30 page decks and they're still trying to process what happened two meetings ago <laughs> and you spend the first few minutes they're just kind of remember what you talked about before and you've lost them and so what we did, especially in our class, is we said, you know, you need an executive summary for everything you do. One to two pages that can articulate your strategy. Now, you may want to have a deck to, to back it up in terms of collateral material, but uh, Agile is, again, it doesn't focus on big, extensive communications. It focuses on uh, written communications. Uh, it talks about communicating with the customer through daily interactions and small bits of information. So that's a key consideration. Thank you, Wayne. And remember, the customers for us in HR are uh, the department heads, CEO, CFO, it may not always mean the end customer is at the store or is it in exactly. line. So remember that part. Thank you very much, Wayne. So I want to remind all the audience, feel free to ask questions. You can do that by raising your hand at the bottom of the screen, putting them in the chat, or putting them in the Q&A. So let's dive into some more details, gentlemen. Uh, James, Talk to me about how you have incorporated design thinking essentials specifically and responding, responding, excuse me, to COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll answer that one. The other thing I'd say is, uh, you know, a little bit like Wayne, I, I absolutely love that uh, break bigger things down into smaller pieces. And to give kind of a firsthand example, I remember thinking standing in Ho Chi Minh City in a little kind of agile development team with our project inception done. I was like, we have designed the most beautiful wireframes on a wall for this system that we're going to build or this portal we're going to build. I thought this is awesome. And I thought, holy crap, how on earth are we going to get this done? I have no idea. I found it really energizing, but overwhelming. And the way that it was structured with Agile to break it down. So we're really clear on each day about blockers, all the things. Now everyone uses a slightly different framework, but broadly similar and about 
you know, it was kind of the perfect communication. It was like, what are you worrying about today? How are you working on it? What's not working? What do you need? It was actually beautiful. And I think the other reflection I had and clearly looking at the list of folks that are on the call from all around the world, um, you know, there are things that we, we know about cross-cultural communication and differences and language, all of that. And even with, you know, a, an Asian neighbor of ours that we get on really well with in Vietnam, there were things that I was saying something and they were totally, totally different interpretations. So getting people together, just making sure that we were on the right track worked beautifully. And that product's still going sort of eight years later within that bank, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I'm not there anymore. <laughs> um, to go to your question, sorry, Michael, I just wanted to throw that one in. To go to your question on about on how we should be incorporating or thinking about design thinking uh, in COVID-19. At the start, I said design thinking is about empathy. And I think there's lots out there. And I think we all feel it. We spoke about how it feels, how we're dealing with it um, personally. What we know is that empathy is going to be required. And it's been used hopefully well by most people through this. It's going to be needed after that. And what we know about it, about this whole COVID thing is it's not even, it's super uneven on people. And I think here, you know, in the US, I'm learning about the US still, but back home is the same. It's much worse for you depending on whether you're male or female or your gender. Uh, it's worse depending on your cultural background for a whole range of reasons, your level of education. A whole, you can read any newspaper, any bit of information, and it's really uneven. Um, we spoke about, you know, jokingly in a way about HR being an essential worker, but it's super uneven whether you're in health, education, depend, you know, frontline worker of any kind. It's super uneven and it doesn't matter what your political view is or where you're sitting in the world. I think that what we can agree is it's uneven and that empathy is really key in this. We've kind of been thinking about it going back a little bit into like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and what's the empathy on that. And so if you go right back down at the start of this whole thing and you see it in some of the data that's out there, people went to, we need food, shelter, we need to kind of get ourselves sorted and ready for this. Um, and people did a job of that, you know, buying consumer discretion, oh, sorry, consumer staple items went, you know, everyone stocked up on pasta and whatever, whatever they want to buy, but they're core things. Um, once you get through that, it looks different. And so we need to build for this. And I've, I've kind of put this into three buckets. I think we had this immediate empathy kind of period and we kind of covered that. Um, the world got turned on its head and we kind of muddled through it as best we could. Then I think there's got to be, and we're probably close to this now, and this will depend a little bit about where you are in the world. I think back home in Australia, we're in this phase now. Here we're in it, but it's a little different depending on what state you're in um, and things like that and how bad it's been there, which makes sense. But I, I would call it basically like planful empathy. So I think we need to start thinking carefully about what we're going to do, how we're doing it, what's sensible to reopen. As HR professionals, I think applying empathy to our workforce and or our customers or our people applying it to, the, to their customers makes perfect sense. How are we going to sensibly open? What are the key needs? How are we going to look at safety, security, interaction, belongingness? Um, a lot of people are assuming we're going to be radically different after this and our way of working is going to be radically different. I don't disagree, but I think we'll be surprised that when we really ask people they'll also want to go back where they can to some of the things that were lost. So I think there'll be this balance of things that are quite different and things that are quite similar as much as they can be, or at least they'll phase like that over time. So I think we need to be, have planful empathy. And then the third one, and I think it's big and I hope it's not controversial, but I think it's very hacking HR appropriate in all of this is this sort of strategic empathy. And I think that's more, I don't want to say radical in like a bad way, but it's looking at some of the working systems and structures that, maybe didn't work well at all. So things that, uh, you know, we think of, maybe it's things like health, but it's definitely things like diversity and inclusion. I think it's things like flexible work. It wasn't so long ago, and I'm assuming America and Australia the same is, you know, everyone comes out saying they're really supportive of flexible working, but when you really look at it, it might be, it's probably not as flexible as, as you might've thought. Um, I, I think this is said, it's been sort of a radical experiment and you know, I wish that it wasn't in this way that we came to this, but a radical experiment to say, actually we can do a pretty good job of working flexibly, but it does depend on our industry too. Uh, but it also shows you that people can flip, pivot, 
you know, apply, apply kind of empathy to their business models quite quickly. Uh, that's got some big implications for HR going forward. So I think, yes, you can apply it. I think you've got to look at the immediate, look at the planful sort of what's happening all the time and then more strategically in applying that empathy. Yeah, I would say I that uh, uh, you, you, you've already, we've already started using some of our EBITDA techniques. The first one being experimentation. I mean, yeah. what bigger experiment to take everybody in office and have them move to a virtual setting in days and weeks, if not sooner. That's a massive uh, experiment. I call it the age of experimentation. And so we've used what we call an agile ready, fire, aim, because we, you can never going to get the, it right the first time. All you can do is do your best effort, see how it goes and adjust it. And so congratulations, everybody has been doing that. So now the, the, the challenge is bringing people back. And that's going to be a lot worse because the, we're not going to bring everybody back at the same time into the same position, the same location. So how do you manage that? And so what I've seen companies doing is uh, developing small pilot programs to look at different alternatives. Do we want to encourage more work from home? Do you want to have some people in the office? What's the layout of the office going to look like? Who are going to be involved? What kind of equipment are going to need? The challenge too is, you know, all our systems typically are built for people face-to-face. -face. Supervised leaders typically evaluate their subordinates through face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, you're not going to have that anymore, right? And so how do you measure output when you don't see someone? Um, you know, in terms of focusing on work gets done. And, and so budgeting and planning and talent, and all these things are, you know, hardwired the way they were before. And so we're going to need to look at them a little differently. And, and so some of the HR leaders I've talked to started doing that. They started uh, experimenting with pilot programs. And again, it, it's a great time to do that because no one's expecting perfection. I'm amazed how flexible people, flexible people are. They're not looking for perfection. They're looking for honest, transparency and commitment. So if I, for those in the call, depending, it doesn't really matter your level, I would think about, you know, starting to experiment with some things, uh, looking at some ideas that perhaps you hadn't thought about before, that now would be a nice way to get started. Um, because again, you have people receptive to these ideas because no one has all the answers, but they want to want to be able to try different things. So that's, that's why I've seen some Companies, HR leaders have been really applying some agile and design thinking techniques. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, so we always hear about putting the employee first. Every company in the world used to say that. And since COVID-19 has occurred, it's really showing who is a shower and who is a doer, who walks a walk and who talks a talk. Uh, it's really uh, showed some companies that do it very well and some that do not. So Wayne, I uh, jump to you. Mm -hmm. How has Agile HR helped you keep the employee first? Well, uh, Agile HR has a, a tremendous focus on the customer. So who's a customer? It could be a stakeholder. If I'm a first line manager, I would view my employees as customers. I would view, I would view my supervisor's customer. I would view my customers as customers. I guess you can call them stakeholders. These are people that you need to uh, you need to facilitate their success. And so Agile talks about servant leadership. Uh, we've kind of morphed that to more shared leadership where the leadership is, is co-owned by the employees and the team and the owner. But be that as it may, one of the principles is ongoing conversations with your customers. The big problem in HR projects is that, you know, we, we take six months, a year to do something, but we don't really involve the customer in the process. And when we get towards the end, the customer doesn't really like what they see uh, because it's taken too long. Things have changed. Whereas Agile requires daily interactions with a product owner, which is a representative of the business. And your product owner is involved in developing the scope of the project, uh, evaluating if it is it successful, what, what do we need to tweak. And so the system of Agile uh, it, it, it incorporates constant communications. And so you're very rarely going to get something that's not okay with the customer because they've been involved with it day along and you've adjusted. The nice thing about Agile, since you break things into two to small increments, you can adjust quickly. Uh, things change, whether a COVID-19 or some other things. And so it, it, the system itself allows constant customer interaction, employee interaction. 
Thank you, Wayne. James, talk a little bit about the design thing, design thing aspect, excuse me, yeah. and how you directly bring that to the customer slash employee. Yeah, and I think um, actually design thinking and agile come together a little bit in that particular one. And I agree with what Wayne said there totally. I think uh, that constant interaction, that constant empathizing with people and customers, understanding what's the same. I think let's just think about the word experience for a second. What we know is that broadly speaking, all of us as humans on the planet, whether we're an employee or customer, doesn't matter. Like we are all of those things depending on what we're looking at. Uh, in some way, shape or form. And I use the word employee to mean, you know, contract. It doesn't matter what your exact employment arrangements are in that case. Um, we've all had a lived experience now that we're all still sharing. It may be quite different, but we've all experienced COVID-19. Uh, so I think it's moving really quickly. It's kind of needs to be this constant empathy and constant checking in and we're getting that. I think that if we're designing, imagine if you were running a project in December time on whatever the topic in HR you like, on talent, and you've just decided to drop it in now, like, but you haven't kind of empathized or gone back to it or looked at it or how it's changed, how the workplace situations change, change when you're gonna reopen. So I think uh, it's, it's key right now on employee experience. One, employee experience has probably shifted. Two, it's uh, uh, design thinking is gonna help you make sure that your oriented to the right things, even if they've moved, you're going to be checking that that is the case or not. Some of the things you uh, hypothesized about tested before may hold and other things might be quite different and your solution may need to change. Um, it, all of those things are possible. How we kind of look at it, I mean, lots of people would do some variation of, and this is kind of one of the tools, okay. a customer or employee journey map. I would say you could almost do this, like I've got a piece of paper with me now, you can just kind of draw it out and we call it something um, I, I think it will translate like a swimming pool, but just what your lanes are like that you swim in in the pool. You could just plot that out and whatever topic you're looking at, let's say it's talent, you could plot out what does it look like for the experience of employees? What are they worried about? Uh, you can look at it from a leader perspective. What does the organization need from talent? How does it shift? You can kind of plot that out quite quickly. You can do something more sophisticated and project driven and um, through that, but you can do something pretty quick as the sort of hack, which is just on the piece of paper. Um, I think co constantly orienting to that is a good one right now. Thank you, gentlemen. So last question before we get to the two things the audience can do starting tomorrow. When you're thinking of design thinking or agile framework, how do you respond to the time constraints? We all saw March 11th or for those I mean March 13th, whatever it was in your state as something that made you change dramatically quickly. And for those in HR, the old joke is things don't move very quickly in HR, kind of have a meeting for that, meeting for this, maybe a month later, there's a decision, then a month yep. later, etc. Talk a little bit about how you use design thinking and agile framework to respond to those time constraints and the immediate need for change. Talk about uh, that way, and then we'll jump to James. Okay. Well, agile has a way of uh, uh, shrinking things down into two to three week increments. They're called sprints. Mm -hmm. And so as you break big things into small pieces, you want to fit them into two to three week time periods uh, to develop a piece of it. Now, you're not going to do the whole enchilada in one sitting, but you want to do a little bit in two weeks and a little bit in two weeks and a little bit in two more weeks. And the reason for that is a couple of things. Um, it's a lot easier to break things down. It's less overwhelming, as James was talking about. You have, after two weeks, you have some kind of success, right? The problem in a long project, you don't get successes. People don't give you kudos because you don't really achieve milestones. Whereas with an agile, at the end of every two to three week sprint, you have what they call a kind of a, a planning session or a review session where you show what you've done. And I've worked in many uh, software shops where that was, and with HR leaders, it was really exciting to at least see some, some right. representation of success that people did. And so, again, a two to three week time period is a manageable block. You can do all the things you need to do and get it done and then move on to the next thing. And so that's how Agile deals with time uh, versus a waterfall process where you take six months to a year and you never know what's going on. But by breaking it down to small pieces, you're able to kind of demonstrate successes. You keep people motivated. There's nothing more demotivating and more frustrating when you go with a project that doesn't go anywhere. You go to this meetings, the same thing comes up all the time. People blame each other. Uh, it's, it's worse than root canal in some respects. 
okay? So at least with the root canal, when you get it fixed, the pain goes away. But when you're in these constant meetings, it's like your agony for months. So Agile takes it and, and makes it into smaller pieces. And that's, that's, to me, a more effective way to manage time. Yeah. And, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think in all of this, sometimes design thinking, for example, is like, you get and you'll see it and anytime you use this process whether it's in an hr project or an it project or you know anything you could think of you get this amazing energy behind it. it's now time to ideate and you get this like let's do this crazy idea like you know there are no constraints let's open our thinking out and that's a really kind of important part of the process but then you realize that your project is funded by your organization like you know you need to get to a really meaningful result about what can be done within the constraints so you absolutely need to balance no constraints at all and purely what you found through your empathy kind of work on the flip side though constraints are what can drive and you know people talk about a lot you know constraints drive creativity and innovation and they do but i think right now COVID has thrown up a whole a whole a whole whoa range of constraints for us to ponder uh you know that that i think are these particularly helpful ones? No. Do we wish we didn't have them? Yes, of course we wish we didn't have them and the, and the human impact. But I think it's got to make us think harder, think of novel approaches and constraints can absolutely bring some amazing solutions. I, I, I think of, you know, I'm not saying for one moment that these organizations did a design thinking or an agile implementation process, but, but they probably had elements of it. I think of like, local businesses in the Philly area, and you know, it'll probably show what I'm interested in, but things like, you know, local gin distilleries that are making hand sanitizer and they're all over the country, but to be able to go, what do people really need right now? They probably still do need a little bit of gin or whatever they're making, but they absolutely need hand sanitizer to keep safe. That market for them is totally different. And they've kind of done that really quickly based on the constraints that they're dealing with, based on the needs of users, customers, whatever you want to call it the needs of people. I think that that's pretty big. So constraints uh, sound annoying for the wild ideas that are out there, that part of your brain, but for the, um, uh, you know, making something real, making something happen, it's really important. Absolutely. Uh, you may see me bob my head up and down over here, getting snacks, getting milk for my two-year-old. So <laughs> usual things that happen during meetings. So James, uh, you can close this out and we'll get to some audience questions. What are one to two things the audience can do starting tomorrow to incorporate design thinking in their general world and the COVID-19 world? Yeah, so I put three little things down here as well. One, and this is sort of about your mindset, is don't assume uh, you know exactly what your employees do and don't want through COVID where we are now and post-COVID. Because I think, you know, motherhood statements are dangerous. Who knows what will be yeah. right? There's a lot of talk about from a range of companies, big and small, that people won't want to go back to an office. And I can tell you, uh, you know, as a human being in an office of one over here in the US, but with a team back in Australia, is I, I, I can't wait to go back into my office. I love going in because I get interaction with other people. So um, that, that might be me. Do I think that I can be more balanced and think differently about how I approach my work and apply flex? Yes. But I think uh, we shouldn't assume that everyone wants exactly the same thing. We should never assume that. I think a lot of folks on here will be great at HR professionals. That won't be what they do. Um, but I think, yeah, don't assume anything. Ask, check in, all of that's great. So I think that mindset of empathy is the other one. You can start with that. You know, you pro hopefully and probably got it already. Keep that going. Empathy, the more empathy you have, the more you drive to understanding, the more you bash out assumptions, uh, the better your solutions will be in the end. And then I think the third one, and I think Wayne actually raised and it's beautiful, is what I would call carve out some space for design thinking slash experimentation. So what you can do that's a bit incremental is read up some more, watch a video, connect with someone else on a problem that you're looking at. That's one. The second part of that, if, you, if you're ready to go bigger, is assemble a bit of a, a team together, virtually, of course, but uh, about pivoting your workforce, your business, your product through this period and after it. I think you can do that today if not if not tomorrow absolutely go ahead Wayne yeah so I think um, you know engaging employees is is tough nowadays because of all the things that are going on and and you know I think James had mentioned Maslow I mean <laughs> people out of work so you know they don't know where the next bill is and so the 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 uh, uh, physiological safety is a challenge for most 
what I think Agile does is it, um, especially with self-guided teams, which is a big piece of it, that when you're in a team like that, it really encourages uh, individual contribution. It really brings out the best in people. Um, as a manager, you really have to put the right team together. You have to get the right talent. And it depends on uh, the project, right? The, the, for this project over here to make widgets, you're gonna have certain talent. For this project over here to make something else, you're gonna have different talent. And it really is a leader who has to kind of analyze what talent I have. We call them hidden assets. I'll tell you a story, we were working with a company, a big, big, big um, human capital software company, and she was trying to uh, get a big customer. And uh, there was some challenges, and then she realized uh, in the conversation that the particular client was, was big into yoga. He really did a lot of yoga. It was a yogi, I think they call it. And then she remembered that a couple of her employees were big in yoga also. So what she did is she put them together and she wound up closing the deal. And so it's looking at the talent you have, looking for those hidden assets and bringing them out into people. People, I think, want to contribute. Uh, it, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of people are scared. They, they see their friends, they're out of work. Their friends are getting fired. They may have some relatives that are, have been affected or died. They may have grandparents. And so um, I think you really have to get their mind, part, part of that, more of their mind share to focus on positive things, to focus on building this project, to focus on positive outcomes. And I think design thinking, which is really focused on the customer and agile, which is a way of working to achieve that, really help do that. And, and so, um, you know, you can have explicit programs on how to engage employees, but I think if you can change the way you work to automatically engage employees just by the way that things are being, being done is a better way to go, in my opinion. Absolutely great tips, gentlemen. Yeah, a question from one of the uh, audience members. Question says, we may be gearing up for a second wave of outbreak later in the year. How do we better prepare for any coming business interruptions using design thinking and agile methodology? Is there a formula or a template that we can use? So I thought out to both you gentlemen, uh, either one can jump into that first. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the ball question here, I guess. So, uh, <laughs> I agree with that. It's a great question. Uh, I, I, so I was sort of thinking of the Wayne's point on hidden assets and uh, someone mentioned, you know, uh, in the chat, uh, as well as catching up on the comments there, because there's some great stuff going through and you get a bit distracted when you're presenting, looking at those two. So <laughs> apologies. I think uh, the hidden asset one and what we're seeing from supervisors, if I can go there first for that question was, uh, it's super interesting, you know, Wayne and I were talking and, and Michael before, you know, the preventions, you, you get ready for your cats in the background, the sunlight coming in, getting the snacks for the kids. Uh, you know, all of that, all of that. The light off my head. Yeah, yeah so. no, no matter how much we talk about, you know, belonging, family, the whole person at work, we only ever see the tip of the iceberg. So I was really thinking down your hidden hidden assets part, uh, Wayne. I think what, what we should be doing here, and you know, most organizations before COVID, even though they didn't know they were gonna need to use it, had some form, I'm sure, of business continuity plan, crisis management plan, whatever. Do they have pandemics written into that? Probably. Do they have, you know, sudden shutdown, all that? Yes. Do you ever know the magnitude or the conditions you're going to face? No. Do we, is there going to be a second wave? Probably. Will there be more than two? Maybe. We're seeing a little bit from China now. We're seeing parts of states in Australia actually having similar question marks at least. I think all you can do is get in front of it, talk to your people, talk to your leaders, Make sure that you're running into the fact, what will happen if we do this? How will we reopen if there will be, will be a second wave? What can we do to minimize the risk? It's like, you know, is design thinking perfect on that? No. Uh, is anything perfect on that? No. Uh, but can you absolutely use empathy and be talking to people, testing your plans? And basically, like it's a very kind of banking one, but basically what's your stress testing now? Like what are your scenarios? What are you going to be doing? What happens if, and I think someone mentioned uh, working with a retail client too. And I was picking up on that because my brother back home runs a restaurant, <laughs> uh, a very nice Mexican restaurant. We'll recommend if anyone goes to Sydney eventually that <laughs> restaurant. But, you know, he's been furloughed from work and that, that's his life. And it's a very different, uh, he doesn't own it. He, he works for the people, 
have they been nice to him? Yes. Is he now sitting at home, you know, after working long 16 hour days, loving, making sure that everyone that comes in has a great experience? Yes, that's gone. That's pretty big. Uh, I think, you know, we got to be scenario planning for it not changing. We also have to, we kind of have to go for every angle. I'm going, you know, passion in my response, but I think that the, <laughs> the empathy and vulnerability needs to be high because it is crystal ball. Yeah. No, I agree a hundred percent. I think, um, you know, with metrics and, 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 and analytics, we can anticipate some minor things coming up, but we don't know what the next uh, pandemic is going to be. You know, we had 9-11, we had the Great Recession. Now it's, I guess, called mini, mini recession now. This, this thing going on, who knows what's going to happen next. And so really the only thing you do is plan to get better at it, being, being able to respond more effectively, right? And so you may get some early warnings and be responsive, but it, you need to be more agile. You need to be able to shift on a dime that uh, instead of taking, you know, three weeks to move everybody out, maybe it takes a half a week or whatever the issue is. Um, and you can only do that when you're more agile. And so uh, that's why I, I, I really suggest for most companies is that they really practice and, and start to incorporate some agile work practices. Again, breaking big things down, getting decisions on, high, on, on self-guided teams, sharing leadership, less documentation. The time is now to do that. And as you incorporate these into your organization, the next time something like this comes up, and it will be, you'll be able to respond. I think planning is essential. At the same time, you need to kind of improve the way you work and handle these things because you're never going to get it right the first time, right? You're never going to anticipate it. All you can do is figure out a better way to respond. And by doing that, you, you create a more agile organization. You create higher level of interest and engagement and passion. Uh, all good things that can get you through regardless of what the situation occurs. Great responses. Um, so one more question from Geetha. And I think the audience has heard enough of James. His question is for Wayne. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Uh, so I think the question is, how have you been, how have you seen, excuse me, organizations and leadership supporting Agile and HR since as a discipline change, which he means, Many people have not been doing HR, Agile HR, or are not doing it right now. Does it have to be from the top down? Outside of hiring you, Wayne, what can they do today to make sure that Agile HR gets sold within the organization and is implemented and not just another flavor yeah. of the week? Well, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a tough, tough journey here. I'm not going to tell you that every company has embraced this and really moving forward, Geetha. It's, it's been slow and very incremental. I think um, in theory, it makes sense. We need to be more agile, right? The problem is, you know, when a senior leader talks about agile, they're not really talking about themselves. They're talking about everybody else. But I found a lot of <laughs> clients I work with is they, they get this uh, sponsorship of a, a budget for a program, small agile initiative or design thinking. They go out there, they do great stuff, and then they want to expand it and they run into resistance. Because senior leaders say, well, I, I, I didn't really want to, I thought it was for those guys, not me. And so that's the problem. Um, you have a company like ING, um, which was, uh, has tremendous success in Agile. Why? Because of two reasons. They're an industry that's going through tr tremendous transformation. The financial industry, banks, insurance companies, everybody you know, does that. It's a lot of challenges with Bitcoins and people, different preferences for, for banking. And so their CEO, you know, to give him her credit, really drove this. This will happen. And so it happened. Um, I think you're in the pharmaceutical company. I don't know if there's as much of a urgency around that. You know, there's higher margins. The interaction with the customer hasn't changed a whole lot like banking. I don't know. And so you really need to create a critical mass. You need to kind of start with one team and be more successful. How do you find that one team? You know, right now, there are people that are more receptive to change in your organization than others, right? You, you've interacted with people. You can tell. Go to them. Get them to start using this and let them tell the story. Not you, but the customer. Let the customers tell the story of how successful, how it changed. Then start getting other customers. You want to create a, excuse the word, a pandemic, epidemic inside for change. It's, it's, it's a, the book called The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell talk about how you drive change. 
you really have to start building incremental improvement until everybody wants to get on board and senior management has to get involved because they see the benefit. The challenge you're gonna have is that people have been very successful doing things they've always done the same way and they don't really see a need to change. At the same time, everything's going to change. And so my suggestion for you is to really start small, incrementally, build the team, show some successes, then start to incrementally scale and let the momentum and the people involved in successes drive the story for you. It's not going to be easy, but there are cases where it's been successful. Thank you very much, Wayne. Appreciate that. So let's wrap this up. Uh, that was all the questions uh, from the audience. So quick spot for James and Wayne. I'll start with you, James. How do they connect with you? How does the audience connect with you after today's uh, chat? If they still want to connect with you, that's unsure <laughs> of right now. Uh, yeah. How do they connect with you and, uh, and your company? I wouldn't be talking my own <laughs> if I didn't say that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Uh, the best way is probably my email and we're very simple in a smaller business. It's just James at moi, M W A H dot live. Uh, I, I was going to say, wouldn't be talking my own book if I didn't say that we needed empathy and that they, you know, I don't know. I don't want to assume that they will want to contact us or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, we've also got our website, www.moi.live. We have a whole heap of information on there. We'd love to see people follow us. But also, we love to see people contribute to our ideas, what we're writing about, what we're talking about, too. We learn the most from talking to people. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm just passionate about Agile. You know, I consider myself an evangelist. So mm -hmm. connect me on LinkedIn. My email is my first name and then my first name, last name. But um, I'm not going to sell you. I'm going to engage you. I'm going to get you involved in this momentum, this movement. I created uh, an informal consortium called the Agile HR Consortium with like-minded people. Uh, I just really believe that this is the future of HR. It really has a uh, uh, tremendous upside in our profession. And, uh, but we need people like yourself who are willing to attend the Hacking HR uh, forum. And there's plenty of them. And you've probably been to many in the last couple months, more, more than you probably want to admit. But you're passionate and we want to tap into that. And so, you know, all three of us, and John on the other end, who you can't see, who's kind of, you know, coordinated this, um, we want you to be involved. And, and so, because we can't do this by ourselves. And so, this is a collaborative effort. Please join us. Please join our chapter. And let's see what we can, you know, we can really, you know, move the profession to another level, next level. Thank you very much, James. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. I also want to give a huge shout out to John Gunawan who is the master craftsman behind this whole event, set up all the questions and everything. So huge kudos to him. Uh, also kudos to the Hacking HR team, Enrique Rubio, and all the behind scenes staff there to make this whole webcast um, happen. Yep. And if you want to get involved in Hacking HR, the future of work, and speaking events like this, hopefully in-person events sooner or later at some point, uh, you can do that at www.hackinghr.io. Uh, so connect there or you can connect with on LinkedIn with me, James or Wayne, if you're in the Philly area, you want to get involved in the Philly things. And for everyone else outside of that can check out the website. And if you want to contact any of us individually, we will get you connected with your local chapter as well. So I want to say thank you to everybody tuning in. Thank you to everybody getting involved today, all the support, all the help and have a wonderful day, guys. Best of luck through COVID-19 and we're all here to support each other. Cool. Thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> See you guys.